does my blood actually get used? Yes, the steer cup. Yeah, the steer cup. So, and, and therefore, that three and a half thousand we need consistently. I am your host, Lula Mankabaka, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Senior Manager Donor Services, Willem van der Meva. And before we start, you know, I'm sure you're wondering, what do we do with the blood? Does it expire? Who receives it? Is Sandbus harboring vampires that they take so much blood? Do they have to feed these vampires? Willem, welcome to the podcast and thank you for joining us. Um, so, so Willem, in my own perception, right, I thought one just donates blood. And if you're an O, you just give that blood as is to an O. And you pass it on. Um, and I didn't think or I didn't understand there was so much that happens in between. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us once the, you've gone through um, the donation and the nurse has asked you, how reckless are you on a scale of one to 10? What happens to that blood once you've passed the recklessness test? So once you pass the recklessness test, so just, to be, just to be sure, the recklessness test uh, is for a very important reason because it's just to make sure that uh, we want to do two things when you donate blood. The one is make sure that you as a donor, will, there will no, be no harm to you. And secondly, and, and just as important, is that whatever we give to the patient will help them as it's supposed to and won't cause any, and won't cause any harm. But the, um, around the question, so once you've passed the recklessness test, is you then get put onto the chair. Um, and the staff would come with a blood bag, a pre-prepared blood bag. Okay. And they will open the needle in front of you. So you'll see that this is the first time that this needle is being used. The first time the back is being used. So put it in, uh, into your arm. Um, and it is not, it is not sore at all. So it's much like if you like pinch the outside of your arm, it's like the same type of, same type of feeling. Uh, and we take 450 milliliters of, of blood and there's three samples that are then also taken with every, every donation for testing. Sure. Um, and, and once the blood is taken, then it gets put into a, a little cooler box, which looks like a cooler box with no beer in it. Yeah. Um, just the blood. Uh, and, and then it gets prepared for, for transport to processing center. So th that's a very interesting aspect that you brought in there because. Um, many people don't consider that there's quite a cost to um, transfusion of blood as well as the processing thereof. Mm -hmm. So do you want to maybe just break it down in terms of what, what are some of the logistics that's involved in the donation of blood and, and what, what happens to that blood sample that they've taken from you once it's left the blood bank? So there's actually quite, a, quite an incredible amount of logistics behind the whole donation processing and the processing of the blood thereafter. So, so we operate in seven out of the eight provinces in, in, in South Africa. And every day, all of the blood that is collected needs to get to a processing center to be processed within 24 hours after the, the donation. So if I donate them Palaborva today, that blood needs to reach the processing center in, in Pretoria on the same day to be processed. So there's... Sandbus drivers, there are couriers, um, people that are contracted on a permanent basis just to be transporting the blood to these processing centers. Sure. Um, and then also the three samples that get taken for testing. There's two testing centers in South Africa. Um, one is in Durban and one is in Johannesburg. Okay. Um, and those samples then get shipped to those different testing centers because the blood cannot be released to go to a patient until those tests have been completed. Uh, so all of these samples need to get there on a daily basis as well. So how do you determine um, which sample goes where? Is is they mm -hmm. are, are the two uh, testing centers based on the type of blood that was uh, withdrawn, or is it a matter of logistics and where you're located in terms of the the donation itself? It's it's based on where you we located, which are the closest testing centers to where the blood is collected. But more importantly, you raise something about how do the how do the specimens link to the to the blood, which is critically important from a safety perspective to ensure that we know which donor's blood goes to which patient. So when you donate, there's a barcode that is put on the 
blood bag and that same barcode to the same number is also put on the specimen tubes so even though the tests are done in a completely different place sure once those results come out we know that this specific unit of blood is safe to go to to do a patient okay so you've also got you i mean i've seen at the donation centers there's mm -hmm. three bags there mm -hmm. um and, and my understanding is that the blood is broken down into three different products. Maybe can you just give us a rundown in terms of what each product is and what it is used for? Mm -hmm. um, and also, I know, we, I mean, coming to, to, to Sambus, it's, it's so weird that unlike in the hospital, you've got your cardiologist and your oncology, but here the, there's, there's names I can't even produce. I mean, I don't know if it was a phlebotomist or phlebotomist or a phlebotomist. Phlebotomist. That's the one. The okay. person who puts in the needle. Yes, the steerker. The steerker. So the, That's the one. The phlebotomy uh, is, is a term that refers to the, uh, I suppose, the putting in of the needle and taking of blood uh, from from someone. Um, so to your question, so once the blood leaves in that cooler box thingy, um, when it reaches the processing center, they then actually separate that unit of blood into the three different components, main components. So Okay. It goes into red cells, um, plasma, and, and platelets um, separated into those components so that when it, a doctor then requires a specific product for a patient, for example, red cells are used, for example, when someone um, suffers from anemia or has had a lot of, uh, lost a lot of blood and therefore has got a, a problem with their iron levels, we didn't get the, the red cells to replace it. And probably a sure. the product that is used the most on a daily basis as well. That's the red blood cells. The, the red, the red okay. blood cells, that's correct. The plasma often is used where you've lost a lot of volume and volume needs to be replaced and also for burn victims. Um, and then platelets is used a lot for cancer patient, patients during uh, when their platelet count is very low due to chemotherapy that they've uh, received that might have destroyed their platelets. So the platelets is, is, is used for that thing. Uh, so it's separated to the processing center and then it goes out to the 84 blood banks and those blood banks are mostly based in hospitals mm -hmm. um, but even if a patient requires blood in a hospital um, where there's not a blood bank we've again got logistics in place to make sure that that blood gets to the hospital where it's required from from the blood bank so ladies and gents one yeah. donation three products so you are really making a difference when you donate in terms of our donations it, it used to be quite a manual process mm -hmm. And it's it's good to see that we've we've digitized the the whole donation process. Um, you've got someone who helps you fill in um, screening questions, the ones mm -hmm. about the recklessness. Um, and another interesting one is that you know you took away my favorite question, which was asking men if they were pregnant. I mean that I thought was you know equality and wokeness, but <laughs> I don't know why you did away with that. But do you want to maybe just talk about digitization and? What difference has it made in terms of making the process far more seamless? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you should have seen the answers we got to some of those questions uh, that were asked of male donors. Uh, yeah, definitely. The, the, the whole process has been digitized. Sure. Um, and it just ensures that the accuracy of the information that we get, the time that it takes the donor to get through the process of donating blood from when you get in until you're able to leave, it's just much more seamless, but it also prepares us to be able to make much more improvements in future um, where potentially we could launch an app or we would be able to just make the period that a person spends at the donation center shorter than what it is currently. Not that we don't want people to be for at our donor centers for <laughs> a long time because often it is a it becomes a big social event at many of the donation sites. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, we just want to, through the digitization process, just make it seamless, make it easier for people to come and donate. So, you know, a lot of people ask, I donate blood. Um, why am I not allowed to donate blood and keep some away for my family members or for friends who are a perfect match? Um, what, what, what is the rationale behind that? And if I'm a regular donor, why is it that um, I don't receive blood for free? So when you, when blood is donated, it's not like a, a commodity that we can keep for like gold, a, a, like gold for a long time, which it is very close to gold, but you can't keep it yeah. uh, for a long time like gold. 
Uh, so the red blood cells, for example, and we can keep for 42 days. The plasma uh, can be kept for up to a year if it's frozen. Sure. Um, and the platelets you can only keep for, for five days, um, which means that even if we wanted to keep blood for a specific person at a specific time, we would only be able to keep it for a very limited, a limited period. But that is why we need donors to donate on a regular basis to ensure that if any one of us needs us, then it is available. Um, to your question about why I don't get blood for free when I donate it, um, and it really, the answer is around the fact that there is, and you mentioned it around the logistics and everything that takes place, that there is so much cost in the collection, the testing, processing, issuing of blood, um, that we do need to find a way to recuperate that and make sure that this organization is sustainable uh, and we're able to continuously supply safe blood uh, for, for all patients. Which is quite interesting, you know, because I think many people view it as I've made a donation and I should be able to store it like, mm -hmm. like money in the bank. Um, mm -hmm. But because it's got a, a shelf life, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't exactly um, go about it in, in that particular fashion. So another question a lot of people do ask is, does my blood actually get used? The short answer is yes, absolutely it does. Um, and, and I think much more so than many people realize uh, that there are literally thousands of different blood products that are used on a on a daily basis. Um, and although there's so many technological advances in medical health care um, and, and in medicines, still there is just no replacement for, for, for human blood. Yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah, so absolutely it is used, it is required, it is essential uh, for patients to get better. So, William, something that's um, quite interesting is for us to stay at that sort of safe yeah. um, blood supply level, how many donations do we need um, for us to always make sure that there's sufficient stock or sufficient supply? So for us to be sure that there's always uh, consistently sufficient blood uh, that the patients require every day, we need about 3,500 donations every single day to, to be made. Um, and, and different to what is often thought that we need more donations over Easter or over holiday periods because there's accidents. Um, actually, because we use blood for things mostly that happen to people, normal people like all of us every day, mm. like women during childbirth, uh, children that are receiving blood because of uh, receiving treatment for, for cancer. Um, and these are things that don't know specific times. They happen every day they happen normally um, and, and therefore that three and a half thousand we need consistently across the year because that's when blood is blood is used oh thank you so much for that so maybe just to recap mm. on what we covered is for donations you can donate at one of the sandbus uh, donation centers or look out for our mobile drives which predominantly happen at malls or at schools um, and that blood gets tested in a lab Mm -hmm. And then we test and then we break it down into three products. And those three products, just watch me. I don't do the phlebotomy thing again. Mm -hmm. Into platelets, red blood cells, as well as plasma. plasma. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Okay. And then it is stored safely. And each of the products obviously have different shelf life. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last part is that it's transfused into those who need it the most. Mm -hmm. All right. And just to talk on the mobile bit that you mentioned. So um, if anyone is interested in having us come with a team to your school or your uh, university or wherever you might be working or, or, or studying, then get hold of us. We've got teams that come out and make it more convenient for you to donate. Thank you so much for joining us, Willem. It was a very interesting breakdown in terms of what happens to our blood. Um, very informative because most of us thought we just go in a bag and then take it to the hospital and that's the, the, the end of it. So there you have it, folks. In terms of your donations, they don't just disappear. They actually do get used everywhere. And if you enjoyed this episode, we'd like to encourage you to like, share with a friend and subscribe on our YouTube channel. It's called the Official Sandbus Channel. And as we say, until next time, stay safe, stay generous, and remember, your blood saves lives.